Faith overcomes, people told me. Faith overcomes. You must be born again. And that I took a real interest in. You must be born again. I want to know how does this work? Where is the proof in the scripture? It brought me Romans chapter 8. It's very interesting. Romans chapter 8, Paul says, if you are born again, what happens is the Spirit of God comes into you and it tells you that God is now your Father and so you cry out, Abba, Father. So this is how it's supposed to work. It's fascinating. I gave that a lot of thought. But I got to thinking about this word Abba. It's unusual. It means Father in Aramaic. So I looked up the word Abba. Where else is it in the Bible? Well, there's only one other place that Paul talks about Abba. I'll let you find it for yourself. One other place he talks about Abba. And in this place, he also talks about how it is that this thing works. He says, the Spirit of God comes within you. You become a child of God. You call out to God, Abba, Father. Now God is your Father. And he goes on to say, now you have a new mother also. A new mother. God is your Father and you have a mother. Since 1969 till now, 15 years, I have yet to meet someone who's born again and ask them, who's your father? They say, God. I say, who's your mother? They don't know. Why not? It's in the Bible. It says you have a new mother if you're born again. Why did the Spirit of God, when it came within you, forget to tell you who was your mother? It's there. Let you find it. It's there. It's important. You see, in Islam, if you call a man a liar, you better have proof or you're the one that's in trouble. If somebody over there calls me a liar, he better have proof, you see, unless he's not a Muslim. If other religions permit you to call that name without proof, that's their business. Now, as I say, for many years I went directly to priests and ministers. From about 1969 till 77, thereabouts. And round and round we go. I don't want to bore you with a lot of the conversations, but they go around in tiny little circles and it's disappointing. People ask me, they say, who was the father of Jesus? I say, he didn't have a father. And they say, well then, you see, Mary is the mother, God is the father. So I would ask, do you mean Mary is the wife of God? No, they're horrified. No, 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 no. God is the father, Mary is the mother. And I'd ask, you mean his, his parents weren't married though? No, God doesn't take a wife. So we go on to something else. And they say, but Jesus called God Father. And I always ask people who tell me that, I say, what do you call God? Probably it's Father. People who say that, they pray, our Father. But he called himself Son of God, they say. And I tell them, yes, and he called lots of other people Son of God. He said, blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called Sons of God. I became very frustrated on the crucifixion. I believed <laughs> that the crucifixion happened, but I want to know why. I asked so many people, I said, why did God have to become a man and die? If a price has to be paid for our sins, why can't we just go find a sinless man and execute him? And say, there, the price is paid. To which people always said, no, if a man dies, it's not enough. It has to be someone who is God and man. And so I'd always ask them, do you mean God died? Say, no, no, no. Only the man died. We're back where we started from. If the man dies, it isn't good enough. See, that's, a, that's not a novel idea on my part. The church is still discussing that till this day. They're still not sure who died on the cross. Was it God or was it man or was it the God man or what was the deal? Because it can't, if God doesn't die, because that means changing from one state to another, and God doesn't change from one state to another, he's supposed to be immutable, and so on. They're still discussing that. They say, Jesus paid a price for your sins. Paid a price. Could never understand that. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. He said, pray like this. And one of the lines he told them, he said, pray to God, say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. More modern translations say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. How do you forgive someone who owes you a debt? Do you say, you know that money you owe me? Forget it. Now give me the money. If you forgive it, it's that there's no price. Nothing is paid. You say, it's forgiven. 
That's what the Lord's Prayer says. Forgive us our sins the same way we forgive someone who sinned against us. If someone slaps you and you forgive him, that's the end of that. But you don't say, I forgive you for slapping me. Now come here, I want to slap you. You see? You don't do that. About, what would it be, 500 years ago, there was a Jew in Europe, Spinoza was his name, Baruch Spinoza, a philosopher, and he wrote a great deal. And he made the same point that people were making 500 years before him. He was frustrated when the Christians would come to him and say, God became man. He would say, what do you mean? God became man. See, I know what is God and I know what is man. And I can imagine that what was God turned into a man. It's not God anymore. He used to be God. Now he's a man. I can understand that. That at least makes some sense. But that's not what the church teaches. They say, God became man, but he was still God. And that causes a problem. You see, if I have a ball of clay, and I squeeze it, and I put corners on it, and I make it into a cube, I can tell you, you see, the ball became a cube. But I can't tell you, don't be fooled, it's still round. See, if it was one thing, it became another thing, it's not that thing anymore. They solve that by putting a label on it. They call it diophysitism. Doesn't prove anything. It means two natures. Diophysitism. That's an old trick. When you don't know the answer, put a label on it. In ancient Greece, the Greeks, 25 centuries ago, came to their scientists with a question. They'd observed that you eat food, it goes through the system, and some of it comes out. They wanted to know which part of what I take in is the part that feeds me, because evidently I don't need all of it, you see. Well, now, which is the nutritive faculty of the food? And the scientists didn't know, so they said, the part that feeds you is the nutritive faculty of the food. It's like saying the part that feeds you is the part that feeds you. That's all. It's a label. It doesn't answer anything. As I say, I could talk to you for hours about experiences. About 1977, I decided to have a look at the Quran. I never met a Muslim. I lived 100 kilometers from the nearest Muslim. See, what interested me was what non-Muslims said about Muhammad 